Yahoo News investigative correspondent Michael Isakoff reports tonight that, quote, a key Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee said the panel needs to seek testimony from Felix Sater, a business associate of President Trump, and may ultimately have to call the president himself in light of newly disclosed emails about a prospective Trump Tower project in Moscow that was being pursued during the early stages of last year's presidential campaign. This is a bright light in an ever-growing constellation of contacts between Donald Trump and Russia. Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell of California told Yahoo News. Swalwell also told Yahoo News that Sater, a Russian-born convicted felon turned FBI informant, is a relevant witness who may have been a pivotal player in the relationship between Trump and the Russian government. But the committee will likely need to go further to resolve all the questions around this issue, including seeking testimony directly from the president. We don't want to be reckless, said Swalwell, but that should be on the table. My belief is we have to hear from all relevant witnesses, and it does look like he, President Trump, is likely relevant. Also tonight, the Senate Judiciary Committee and Donald Trump Jr. have agreed to a date for a transcribed interview behind closed doors about his meeting with a Russian lawyer and several other people, including other Russians at Trump Tower, including a man suspected of having ties to Russian intelligence. The president's son will not be under oath, and we do not know the exact date of that interview, but Politico reports tonight that a source familiar with the matter said the testimony would likely occur in the next few weeks. Joining us now, Michael Iskoff, chief investigative correspondent for Yahoo News, and Jill Weinbanks, former assistant Watergate special prosecutor and an MSNBC contributor. Uh, Michael, uh, this uh, report <clears throat> that you have from Eric Swalwell saying it looks like the evidence is closing in on the president such that it will make logical sense to include him on the witness list. Uh, that will, will that require uh, the cooperation of Republicans on the committee in order to get uh, President Trump to testify? Sure, and there's inevitably going to be conflict about that. Look, to some extent, Swalwell is stating the obvious. This entire investigation is about potential links between <laughs> um, Trump associates and the Russian government. The central question is, is ultimately going to be, what did the president know about such contacts, and when did he know them? And the only way, ultimately, you can get um, uh, responses to those um, to those questions is to is to question the president himself. Now, whether politically um, you can pull it off, uh, you know, that's a whole other question. Obviously, to the extent that Republicans uh, remain behind the president, uh, they would resist. Right now, they control uh, the House and the Senate, so it's not likely. Um, but as the the pressure builds and as more and more evidence comes out and if you get conflicts in the testimony that the committee gets from some of the participants, um, it's hard to see how they, at the end of the day, don't try to get the president's testimony. And Jill, isn't that uh, the point, that it's going to be a matter of how the evidence develops and if it develops to the point of, uh, as, as Michael says, conflict in the testimony or incriminating testimony about the president uh, that only he can resolve? Uh, that's when uh, you could develop a, a momentum where it becomes difficult to resist the demand that the president testify. I'm not saying the president couldn't resist it, but that Republican members of Congress at some point uh, may have to say, uh, yes, this testimony is required. Every time I ask when is enough sufficient, I am surprised by how much the president can get away with. So, yes, he may not ever really have to testify because the Republicans may not have the courage to force him to, but it is a logical next step. We definitely need to know. And the difference between when he says something in public, even if he's lying, and many of the statements he's made seem to be lies, they're in conflict with other people's testimony, that's not a crime. But if he says it under oath, then it is a crime. So he either has to contradict what he said in the past, or he has to repeat things that are in conflict with other testimony. So that's the danger for him in testifying, and it's exactly why everybody would like him to testify under oath. Yeah, and on the under oath piece with Donald Trump Jr., I just want to point out it is it is a crime to lie to Congress uh, in any 
investigative session that they're doing, whether it's under oath or not. Uh, and so whether he's under oath or not, he is still exposed to what is in effect a possible perjury charge, even though it's technically called something else. If you're not under oath, lying to Congress is similar to lying to an FBI agent. I want to listen to what Representative Adam Schiff said about this. The president had a financial interest, a potential financial interest, in doing business with Russia during the course of the presidential campaign. Uh, and that financial interest may have caused the president to have a pro-Russian uh, foreign policy during the campaign. The president was being less than truthful about pursuing business with Russia during the campaign. This is part of a pattern we have seen not only with the president, but with his son and with others, uh, being less than truthful when it comes to Russian ties. Uh, and Michael, that's the case. And that, that the question is, will that uh, will that pressure continue to build in that direction? Well, if you just look at the record here on what Trump has said about the various issues that relate to these emails, Trump, of course, you know, famously said in the interview with Lester Holt last year, I have zero interest this year, zero interest, nothing to do uh, with Russia. Um, he actually did respond to questions under oath in a deposition about Felix Sater, the twice convicted, convicted felon who actually pitched the whole Trump Tower in Moscow idea. And he said, I wouldn't know him if he walked into the room. And this is a guy who there's multiple pictures of Trump with him at the breaking of uh, breaking ground for Trump Soho. Uh, he had a uh, Sater had a business card uh, that uh, listed his office at Trump Tower and, and identifying him as a senior your advisor to Donald Trump when um, uh, Alan Garten, the chief uh, uh, counsel for the Trump Organization, was asked about this last year. He said the business card was in 2010 and the arrangement that Sater had with the Trump Organization ended six months later. Well, these emails show Sater pitching a project in late 2015 and early 2016 to the Trump Organization. So there are a lot of reasons to question the credibility of the statements that the president and his top people have made about this for quite some time. Uh, Jill, uh, we've got an important question tonight about uh, a report on subpoenas uh, from the special prosecutor's office. Uh, Robert Mueller has subpoenaed a spokesman for the Trump campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, a former spokesman for Paul Manafort, demanding records related to his work with Manafort, seeking that testimony. Also, also subpoenaing a former lawyer for Mr. Manafort, uh, has also received a subpoena. Now this goes straight, uh, I know in everyone's mind, to the attorney-client privilege. And Jill, what are the exceptions in the attorney-client privilege that allow a former lawyer of Paul Manafort's to be subpoenaed? There are a few, not very many, and that attorney-client privilege is really a bond that is hard to break. But, for example, if they were engaged in a business deal together outside their attorney-client relationship, which it does seem that some of Trump's lawyers were also business partners or business employees of his, that would not be covered by the privilege. If they were conspiring to commit a crime, even if the attorney was acting as an attorney, that would not be covered. If they were plotting something uh, that violated federal law or state law, that wouldn't be covered. So there are a few things that could be, but uh, without any more information, it's really speculation as to whether the attorney for anybody could ever be forced to testify against that client. So uh, just game this out for us a little bit. This is uh, one of Paul Manafort's former lawyers. If that lawyer resists the subpoena, do they end up in some kind of evidentiary hearing in court where it is revealed or revealed to us publicly why that lawyer is actually being subpoenaed? It could be. Um, and of course, there is a lot of pressure now to have some of these witnesses who are cooperating in closed door sessions to be public in their testimony because the public has a right to know before the elections what is going on. We shouldn't jump to the conclusion that something criminal has happened, but there's enough suspicion that you can't help but do that. They are acting guilty. The president does everything that makes him look guilty. His son looks guilty. That's just something that can only be 
taken care of if they testify in public and can explain themselves in some way. So yes, it's quite possible that we could possibly find out exactly why the attorney is being questioned. Uh, and Michael, we have at the same time that uh, Democrats are developing the, the possibility of demanding President Trump's testimony, we have at least one Republican in Congress trying to pass an amendment, uh, basically throw an amendment on a budget bill to, tr to limit uh, the special prosecutor's investigation, say that it must end in six months, uh, saying that it can't investigate anything that happened before the presidential campaign. Uh, yeah, I don't think that has much prospect of passing, um, uh, even if House Republicans were going to go down the line uh, and, and keep that in the House bill. Uh, I can't imagine um, the Senate doing the same, especially given the frosty relationship that the president has with Republican senators at the moment. Yeah, and it remains to be seen how many votes it would actually get in the House at this point. Michael sure. Iskoff, Jill Weinbanks, thank you both for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.